This is a compilation of some of the creepiest classic true scary stories found on the internet. I've only ever read one of these stories on my channel about a year ago, but like I said, they're all classics, so if you've heard any of them, I will be leaving timestamps for each story in the description and pinned comment just in case you want to skip past any. Now that that's out of the way, I hope you enjoy the video and let's begin. I've always had a innate fear of the night. Not so much the dark, but the night itself. As a child, my imagination was overcome with stories of creatures that come alive at night and the safety offered by a house and light. I never had anything to base this fear on, until a night when I decided to go with a buddy of mine to a baseball game and got stuck at a light at 2am after dropping him off at home. Of course, that night, the game went into extra innings and so I didn't get a chance to drop my friend off back home until well after 1am. Everything was fine on the way home until I hit a light right before the street that led to my house. It was a T-junction and I was turning left. The light is one of those that you think is broken until it finally turns green right when you finally decide to just run it. So, of course, I pulled up right as the light turned red. I would have just run the light, seeing as no one was there and it was closing in on 2am on a school night. But earlier that week I had heard the phrase, character is what you do when no one is looking and for whatever reason that was the night I decided to prove to myself that I was a man of character. Big mistake. I pulled to a stop at the light, feeling good about myself, bordering on self-righteous when I happened to look out of my window to my left and noticed a lady sitting all alone on a bus bench. We made brief eye contact and I quickly looked away. It was too late. I could see movement out of my peripheral vision and knew she was coming my way. I looked out the window and noticed she was carrying a bag. I quickly checked that my doors were locked and that all my windows were up. I then moved my right foot above the accelerator just in case and braced myself for what was to come. I was hoping it would just be an awkward exchange and was praying for a quick light change before she reached me so I could just get out of there but I knew there was a slim chance of that. She walked right up to my window, put down her bag, and began to tap on my window. I nervously looked up at her and she mentioned for me to put my window down. I had automatic windows, so I just imagined pushing too hard on the window button and that thing just coming all the way down. So I took a deep breath and lightly flicked it with my finger. The window moved microscopically down, but she didn't seem to notice or care. She then leaned in and began to talk. She said, My boyfriend beat me up. I have a friend who lives down the street. Can you give me a ride? I should stop and give you a brief physical description of the bag lady. She was small and skinny and kind of an indeterminate age. She was either in her mid-twenties and had lived a hard 20 plus years on the street, or she was 60-something years old who had lived a moderately hard life on the street. All that to say, just by looking at her, there was no way to verify her story. She looked beat up by life, not just by a boyfriend. But there was something about her delivery. It, it was robotic and seemed practiced like she was disconnected for the moment. That made my skin crawl. And after a brief, maybe about a second debate on whether I should do it, I told her that I had to get home and that I couldn't give her a ride. After my first refusal, she leaned in closer and said the same thing again. My boyfriend beat me up. I have a friend who lives down the street. Can you give me a ride? This time, I felt more confident when I declined to give her a ride and told her I had a curfew and had to get home. She leaned in a third time and began her statement again. My boyfriend beat me up. At this point, the light changed and I slowly lifted my foot off the brake and started slowly rolling forward and began muttering an apology. She didn't move. She just looked at the light, looked down at me, leaned in closer and said five words that have haunted me ever since. You made the right decision. Then she picked up her bag and walked back towards the bench. I peeled out of the intersection and cried and screamed all the way home. I have no idea what she planned to do or if there were more people waiting to jump in my car from the bushes had I moved to let her in, but that encounter has haunted me ever since and has confirmed in my mind that nothing good happens after dark.
During my early 20s, I worked as a meter reader in Iowa City, Iowa. A meter reader is the person who records how much electricity, gas, or water you've used each month. If your meters are on the inside and you want an accurate bill, a meter reader must enter your home whether you're there to let them in or not. Just to clarify, we only entered homes if consent was given when the customer first signed up for service. Customers also provided us with keys if necessary. Entering a home when the owner wasn't there is something that I never got used to. No matter how loudly I knocked, I never shook the uneasy feeling that I wasn't welcome. The inside of a home is the ultimate private space. A home's exterior is just the image of ourselves that we project to the rest of the world. But the further you venture inside, the closer you come to truly seeing what kind of person lives there. And if you want the raw, unfiltered truth, head for the basement. I really hate basements. I've seen walls that look like giant, static-filled TV screens, only until I realized it was roaches scurrying across a white background. Cobwebs so thick and dusty that it looked like the cotton candy machine exploded at the Spider County Fair. I've seen rats, snakes, feces, weapons, neglected children, abused pets, homeless squatters, massive hordes, bizarre sexual items, a makeshift meth lab, and even a coffin. There are usually rational explanations for all of these things. Well, maybe not the coffin, but there was one basement where what I found was beyond the grasp of logic, and that's what made it so terrifying. It was an old apartment house. From the outside, it looked like every other house on the block. I entered the back door and found myself at the top of a staircase. I ran my hand along the wall until it grazed a light switch. I flipped the switch, but no lights turned on. I wasn't carrying a flashlight. A typical route involved five or six hours of walking, so I carried as little as possible. Oftentimes, I used the light from my handheld screen, but it only illuminated whatever was about a foot in front of it. So, armed with the world's worst lantern, I made my way down into the darkness. Once at the bottom, I blindly shuffled across the room, one baby step at a time. With my arms outstretched and head down, I eventually reached the far side of the basement. I shined the dim light from my handheld along the wall and discovered two doors. Each door led into its own small room. I chose the door on the right and I found the meter in the far corner. As I entered the reeds, I began hearing noises coming from the other room. Something was moving and there was whimpering that grew louder the longer I listened. I eventually realized that it was a dog. It sounded weak and distressed. I tried to open the door, but it was locked. At this point, the dog was scratching the other side of the door. I felt helpless. I reported it when I got back to the office, but I couldn't shake the thought of that dog. It stuck with me over the next month, until it was time to return. So there I was, one month later, back within that basement. At least this time, I knew where the meters were located. I shuffled back to the little room on the right while keeping my ears open for any sounds coming from the other room. This time, I heard nothing. I read the meters and started making my way back, but I couldn't shake the memory of that dog. Was it still trapped inside that room? My curiosity got the best of me. I stood outside the door for a few moments, listening. Still nothing. That's when I made a huge mistake. I tried to open the door. I had no more than jiggled the doorknob when I first heard it. Screams. Blood-curdling screams unlike anything I'd ever heard. Sounds that I didn't think a human was even capable of producing. Short, piercing, high-pitched shrieks followed abruptly by a low, drawn-out, guttural moan. That ultimately formed into something that I can only describe as crying, but much louder. It was all over the place, like some sort of psychotic, freeform jazz. I stumbled backwards, nearly losing my balance. I shouted something like, Hello? Who's in there? There was no response. Just screams. Are you okay? Do you need help? Still no response. Just screams. 
There was no doubt that I yelled loud enough for him to hear me. He didn't want my help. He wanted me gone. I fumbled my way through the darkened room toward the exit. When I reached the top of the stairs, I just stood there, listening. I was trying to wrap my mind around what I was hearing. I waited for the screaming to stop, but it never did. When I finally left, it was still as loud and demented as when it began. I felt relieved, but that quickly vanished when I realized I had to do it all over again next month. I reported what I'd heard, but nothing came of it. As my return drew nearer, a sense of dread grew inside of me. What kind of lunatic sits alone in total darkness and silence? My mind created endless explanations for what kind of hell laid beyond that door. By the time I returned, I'd built him up so much in my mind that anyone other than the devil himself would have been a letdown. But there was no sign of him the next month, or even the next several months. I'd nearly given up on solving the mystery when a stroke of luck pulled me back in. One night, I went to a concert with my friend Laura. After the show, I gave her a ride home. She'd moved somewhat recently, so she had to give me directions. I didn't pay much attention to where she was leading me, until she pointed to a house a little bit up the street. I couldn't believe it. She had moved into the house with the mysterious room in the basement. I said to her, Look, this sounds weird, but have you noticed anything odd about the basement at this? But before I could finish my sentence, she blurted out that there was a crazy guy who lives down there. Finally, I had confirmation. She went on to tell me that even though her apartment was in the attic, she often heard him yelling late at night. But that wasn't all. She had actually met him. One day, while walking to her car, she saw him standing in the lawn. He stood perfectly still with no expression on his face. He was directly in her path, so she cautiously made her way around him. She noticed he was staring at her, so she offered a friendly hi as she passed. He had no reaction except for one unsettling exception. He stuck out his tongue, then quickly sucked it back into his mouth and resumed acting like a statue. Thoroughly creeped out, she got into her car and drove away. Two or three months later, I finally met him myself. I entered the back door like I had done so many months before. This time, something was different. There was a light on in the basement. I peered down the staircase. At the bottom, a ragged-looking dog was staring back at me. It was the same dog I'd heard during my first visit. Then I noticed something else. Behind the dog, I could see a pair of bare feet. The ceiling blocked my view of the rest of whoever was standing there, but it didn't matter. I knew it was him. I should have left right then, but I didn't. I know this probably doesn't make any sense, but at this point my desire to finally get some answers outweighed my fear. I shakily called out, Hey, I'm, I'm the meter reader, and started to make my descent. As I made my way down, more of him was revealed. He looked to be middle-aged, his head was shaved, and his eyes were wild. He was wearing pants, but no shirt. What I remember most was how lean and sinewy his body looked. It had a look of a body that was never at rest. I explained who I was and what I was doing there. To my surprise, not only did he talk to me, but he actually sounded somewhat normal. The volume and pitch of his voice was odd, but he said the same sorts of things that people typically said to meter readers. I even started to doubt whether or not he was the same man I'd heard screaming, but soon enough his behavior slowly removed all doubt. As I read the meters, he rapidly paced back and forth. He was constantly wringing his hands together and spastically cocking his head from side to side. The longer he talked, the more agitated he became. He began grimacing and little verbal tics started popping up in his speech. Every so often, he'd blurt out a loud noise in the middle of a sentence. He was trying to suppress these sounds, but he was losing the battle. I started to make my way to the exit, and he followed. His verbal outbursts grew louder and more frequent. I was petrified. When I reached the stairs, I drew our conversation to an end and said goodbye. As I turned to head up the staircase, he could no longer hold it in. 
Screams. The very same unforgettable screams that I'd heard coming from the locked room. I ran up the stairs as fast as my legs could carry me, flung the door open, and rushed back into the daylight. A month or two later, I had a couple friends, including Laura, over to my place. I was excited to tell her all about my encounter. But as I was relaying what happened, I could tell that something else was on her mind. When I finished telling my story, she told me something that she'd seen a couple weeks earlier. One day, she noticed lights flashing outside of her window. She looked outside just in time to see police officers placing the man from the basement in the back seat of a squad car. She later found out from another tenant that he had attacked someone with a knife. That was the last we ever saw of him. I don't know what became of the man in the basement. I'd like to think that he got the help that he needed, but maybe that's just because I'd rather not think about the alternative. This is something that happened to me about two years ago, but thinking about it still gives me chills. I used to live in a small town in rural Missouri with my mother and stepfather. Our house was a few miles outside of town and along an old state highway. We were pretty isolated out there, other than the occasional passing car or farm equipment. One day, I came home from a morning shift at work. I was pretty tired, so I immediately came in the front door and sprawled out on the couch. My mother and stepfather were preparing to go into town to visit a family friend. So I just started a movie and quickly drifted off to sleep. I remember waking up to the sound of my parents leaving, but after that I slept rather soundly. I must have been asleep for a couple of hours before I was woken up to the sound of my front door opening and closing. I laid silently, hoping to fall back asleep. I assumed it was just my parents returning from their visit. After a moment of silence, I heard an unfamiliar voice say, Where is everybody? My eyes shot open and I looked up to see a man standing over me. I have never seen this man before. He was tall and muscular and he was wearing a white t-shirt with cut off sleeves. He was also covered head to toe in blood. I jumped to my feet instantly. I had never been so scared in my life. Trying to rationalize, I asked, Are you looking for my parents? He stared at me for a moment and asked who I was. I replied by asking, who are you and what the fuck are you doing in my house? He stared at me blankly. I thought I was going to be murdered. He kept talking incoherently and asking where everyone was. At this point, I had no idea who he was referring to. After about five minutes of nearly crippling fear, I realized that the blood that was all over his clothes and his face was his own. I glanced out the living room window toward the highway and then I started to understand. In the drainage ditch in front of my house was a red pickup truck. I told the man to come with me and we went outside. Soon after we got near the truck, another vehicle pulled up. Apparently the man had been drunk driving and had driven his truck into the ditch. He was drunk and had a concussion from the wreck. He was so messed up that he thought that other people were in the truck with him before the wreck when, in fact, he had been alone. He had stumbled into the nearest house looking for help. The driver that had just pulled up drove the man to the hospital and, as far as I know, he was okay. Though I understand the situation now, I will never forget this. It was fucking terrifying. A week or so before my 10th birthday, I walked to the corner store with a $5 bill and picked up a jar of ragu for my mom. On my way home, a man I'd never seen before fell in step with me and began talking. Hi, he said cheerfully. My name is Dr. Ramsey. I'm a pediatrician. Do you know what a pediatrician is? I walked along silently, not replying and fervently hoping he would take that as a sign that he should leave me alone. Subtleties were not his strong suit, though, because he kept right on chattering. Are your parents looking for a pediatrician for you? Of course, you're almost a big girl now. You'll be needing another kind of doctor soon, won't you? That's okay though, they can still bring you to me until then. What's your name? You have beautiful hair. I was just on my way to get some suckers for the candy jar in my office. Do you like suckers? 
Thankfully, we were nearing my house, so I ran forward up the back steps and in through the kitchen door. I didn't know it then, but that was just the beginning of a very long, very scary ordeal. It didn't take long after that for Dr. Ramsey to begin showing up. At first, it seemed benign enough, I mean, at least to a kid. He would drive by nearly every day, smiling and waving. I told my mom, who said maybe it was just on his way home from work. But then the phone calls began. My dad called me into the living room and sat me down. He asked about the day that Dr. Ramsey followed me home and if I talked to him. He said that I wasn't in trouble, but that I needed to tell him the truth. I told him no, and he asked if I was sure or if I could be forgetting something. I told him no again, and he frowned, and then asked, Then how does he know your name? I didn't know. It turns out that wasn't all he knew. He knew my sister's name as well. Pretty soon, neither my sister or I were allowed to answer the phone. He called several times a day. At first, neither of us knew what he was saying. Then, one night, one of my brothers told us that he was telling my parents that he was going to hurt me and later my sister. Things got complicated after that. My dad called the police, but as this was before there were any stalking laws, there wasn't a lot that they could do. They told my parents to call back if he, quote, tried anything. My dad then called a friend of his from back in the day who happened to be a cop. For the next month, my dad's friend escorted me to and from school. Suddenly, life as I knew it came screeching to a halt. I couldn't walk to school alone, I couldn't play outside, I couldn't walk to Super America, which is sort of like a 7-Eleven for those of you who don't know. When access to me was completely denied, things escalated. It was around this time he began threatening my sister as well. Then one afternoon, my sister, two of my brothers, my mom, and I were in the kitchen. One of my brothers saw a glimpse of someone in the garage. They'd seen him too. Dr. Ramsey came bolting out of the garage, my brothers chasing after him. They ran all the way to Cherokee Park where he lost them in the trees. My parents called the police again, but nothing came of it. The only information they had was a description and a name that was almost certainly fake. A couple weeks later, we woke to find our dog hanging from the side porch. She was a gorgeous saddleback German Shepherd born the same day I was. We were all devastated. The cops said that there was no evidence it was him and ruled it accidental, but none of us believed that. His phone calls became more informative in the meantime. He would talk about who was home and who wasn't. If my brother would say my dad was home, he would tell him who was really in the house. He would also talk about the house itself. About the window in the kitchen he could easily open with a knife from the outside even when it was locked and about the French doors that connected the living room to the side porch and how the lock could be finagled from the outside if you jiggled it just right. That night, my dad put in some carpenter nails at the bottom of the French doors until he could get a new lock ordered. My parents had to go to a company event for my dad's work. My older brothers were at St. West Roller Skating Rink. My sister was on the phone with her best friend. My little brother was on the floor asleep and I was watching Devo on the midnight special with Wolfman Jack and it was really late. Suddenly, the top of the French door swung inward, and in the few milliseconds before the nails in the bottom caused them to snap back, I could see his silhouette. My sister whipped the phone at the television, and we ran up the stairs. About halfway up, we realized our little brother was still asleep on the living room floor. As quietly as we could, we slipped back down the stairs to get him. We all went into our bedroom and didn't turn on the light. This way, we could see outside. We watched out the window for a while, and when we didn't find him, we crept down the hall to our brother's room to look. We looked down and could see someone standing at the back door. He knocked loudly. What do you want? My sister asked out the window. He stepped back and said, Is this the Mercy residence? I have a pizza for delivery. Can you come to the door? She scoffed at him, declaring she was not stupid, she could see he didn't have a pizza, and she was calling the cops. He left. A short while later, my brothers returned home. We told them what happened, and they walked around the yard looking for him. 
They came back in and things settled down. By now, we'd pretty much given up on calling the cops because it never helped. So we just went back in, each of us, except my youngest brother still asleep, carrying a knife from the kitchen just in case. Eventually, one of my brothers went into the kitchen to get a bowl of cereal. You know that sensation you get when you can just feel someone watching you? Yeah, he had that in spades. He kept looking around the kitchen through the doorway into the dining room at the windows. He didn't see anything, but he could still feel eyes on him, so he went closer to the door to try and see better. The kitchen lights were reflecting on the windows of the door, as it had three rows of three windows, so he still couldn't see. He stepped closer, then closer again, until he was right up to the door, then cupped his hands on either side of his head so he could see. There, on the other side of the window pane, was Dr. Ramsey smiling back at him. He turned to yell for my older brothers, but when he looked back again, he was gone. They went out again to look for him, but they didn't see him. The next night, we were at the table playing Crazy Eights, and my brother was restless. My sister asked him what was wrong, and he said he always felt like any minute now there would be a loud noise on a door or window. Almost immediately after he finished his sentence, boom, on the window right behind him. In the chaos, the two eldest ran out, but he was already gone. A couple weeks later, I was at school and we were outside on the playground during recess. I was swinging upside down when I saw that now familiar blue Ford Galaxy cruising by, moving slowly. There he was, smiling and waving. He called my name and I ran to the teacher and told her. The school had been told all about him and she took me inside right away and called my mom. That same day, my mom had gotten a call from the school office asking her to verify that my dad was picking me up as he'd called to say that he was on his way. He wasn't. Not long after that, I woke up one night, thirsty. I went down to the kitchen for a drink and there, sitting alone in the dark, was my dad. On the table, a gun. He was tired of the police waiting until Dr. Ramsey tried something. He was tired of his children being terrorized. He was tired of being afraid every time he left for work that something would happen to us while he was gone. I sat with him for some time, watching, before he sent me back to bed. These events and many more took place over a period of around 18 months. Then, as suddenly as it began, it was over. He had vanished from our lives. The phone calls, the drive-by with the creepy waves, everything. For a long time, during and after the Dr. Ramsey days, I would have a reoccurring nightmare in which I would wake up to find him standing over me as I slept. It took a long time before I felt like a kid again. I found out years later that when he was calling, Dr. Ramsey would tell my parents that he was going to rape and kill me and later, my sister, and that there was nothing that they could do about it. I don't know what happened to him when he disappeared. I don't know if he was in a car wreck, locked in prison, in a coma, but sometimes I wonder if the wait ended for my dad when he was sitting in the darkened kitchen one night. I don't know, and I'm not sure I want to. About a year ago, in my final semester in college, I worked at a department store in the mall. I didn't have a car yet, so I asked for day shifts because it was a two-hour bus ride back home. So basically, if I had a closing shift, I'd get it done at 11, but not get home until 1 a.m. But sometimes I'd be given closing shifts, much to my annoyance, since I had a 6.45 a.m. class and my mother's worry because who wants their kid on public transport that late? I mean, sometimes she could come and get me, but it'd be too much of a hassle to get my younger sisters out that late and such, so I never asked her. My managers, being the jerks that they were, gave me a week of closing shifts, knowing my situation. I was pissed, but whatever. One night, I had just finished my shift, got on the bus, sat in the back, and was minding my business when my iPod died. I was annoyed, but I just kept my earbuds in and occupied myself by playing a crossword on my phone. About two seats behind me, I hear these guys speaking Spanish. 
Now, my stepmother is Puerto Rican, so while I understand a fair bit of Spanish, I don't speak it. So, I hear them talking, but I don't pay attention because it's rude to eavesdrop and all. That was until they say, that black girl up there. Then my ears perk up. I keep my earbuds in so that they think I can't hear them and I continue listening. What they're saying is horrific. To paraphrase, they knew my stop, which was the second to last one before the bus gets back to the terminal, and while my stop is at the front of my neighborhood, it's got no street lights, and at this time of night, it's empty. And to put it simply, they were planning on, quote, snatching that piece of ass up. I was about 20 minutes away from home, so I knew I had to act quickly. Since I knew they could see me, as they were two seats behind me, but like across if that makes any sense, I pretended to play on my phone, acting oblivious while I was actually texting my mom. I text her saying, Mom, can you please meet me at the bus stop? Five minutes go by, but no answer. We're getting closer to my stop, so I decide to call her cell phone. No answer. I call the house phone and she finally answers. It's about 12.30 a.m., so she was sleeping. I try to talk as calm and cheerily as I can. This was our conversation. Hey, Mom, uh, did you get my text? Uh, no, what's up? Oh, I, I sent you a picture of these jeans I'm going to order online when I get some. I really need your opinion, so I really need you to go look since the sale ends at 1 a.m. She gets the hint that I need her to look at her cell phone, so I say goodbye and hope for the best. We get to my stop, and thank God I see my mom's car. I pick my shit up and hightail it off the bus. I don't even look behind me to see if they're following me. I jump in the car and tell my mom to just go. I look in the rear view, and I see the guys just staring at the car. The next morning, I called my job and told them I quit. No more public transport for me. Thanks to my stepmom for teaching me Spanish, and thanks to my mom for getting the hint. I hope I never see those creepy, weird Spanish-speaking guys again. A few years back, my girlfriend and I, having hiked several other parts of the Appalachian Trail, decided we wanted to give the southern portion of Virginia's trail a shot. It's about 166 miles long and runs through George Washington and Jefferson National Forest from Roanoke County to Pearlsburg and Giles County. This is definitely one of the more remote and less traveled parts of the trail, which is exactly what we were looking for. We gathered our gear and made our way to the start of the Virginia Creeper Trail to begin our journey. We had planned our journey to end at Damascus and figured that by the time we got there we would be more than ready to get home to our own beds. It was early October and the changing of the leaves and colors were amazing. The air was crisp and cool. It was pretty much perfect hiking weather with beautiful scenery. The majority of the trip was pretty uneventful, just your typical hike. But our last couple of nights is where things got weird. On this portion of the trail, you're supposed to camp on the trail or a designated shelter. We didn't really want to run into any other people and didn't want anyone coming up on us in the middle of the night. So we decided to ignore those suggestions and find our own little spot off the trail. A little searching around and we found a spot a little ways off the trail in the middle of a small clearing. It was perfect. We set up camp, cooked some food, talked for a while, then snuggled up and went to sleep for the night. Somewhere around 2am I was awoken by my girlfriend shaking me awake and telling me, Get your gun! Someone is outside walking around our tent! She informed me that she woke up to what sounded like someone right outside of the tent running a knife or something along the side while circling us. When hiking, I carry a 1911 and a judge with me. After all, you never know exactly who or what you might run into when on such a long hike in a remote location. I got the judge out of my pack, and then we sat silently, listening for any sounds. A few minutes of nothing but the breeze blowing through the trees, and then I heard it. Snapping and crunching noises, someone or something walking in the woods behind our tent. I got the flashlight and silently made my way out of the tent. Our fire had went out, so it was nearly pitch black, illuminated by only the dim glow of the October moon. 
I told my girlfriend to stay put while I checked it out. I didn't flick the flashlight on right away so as not to give away that I was out of the tent and have it become a shining beacon of my location. Instead, I waited to hear more noises. After a few minutes, I heard another snap crunching and cracking. It sounded like it was bipedal based on the way the steps were paced. I turned on the flashlight and flooded the area with light. I thought I saw someone move behind a tree. I yelled out and told them to go away and that I was armed. I kept the light on the area with my gun drawn and slowly approached towards the area where I thought I saw the figure. Then, from my right, I hear what sounds like someone running away through the woods. I spin and face my light that way and then, from the original spot, hear who or whatever it was there take off into the woods. There's no way I'm giving chase, so I return to the campsite. I tell my girlfriend about what happened and I end up sitting guard outside the tent in the darkness until daybreak. In the morning, I looked around a bit for signs of who or whatever it was and I discovered a boot print in some soft, moist dirt not far from our tent. It wasn't mine and it wasn't my girl's. This really freaked me out as it confirmed that someone, perhaps more than one, was skulking around our tent in the dark. I kept it to myself because I didn't want to freak my girl out any more than she already was. At this point, we were pretty deep in and still had two days left. That day, we walked a little faster than normal and covered as much ground as possible. When it came time to set up camp, I found a spot near a cliff where we could place the tent in a small overhang and prevent anyone from coming up behind us. The whole day up to this point, I had a feeling we were being followed. I had no confirmation of this as I hadn't seen or heard anyone else, but it was just a gut feeling. We set up camp and made some food and then retreated to the tent. I gave my girl the 1911 and I kept the judge right next to me and I assured her that if I slept at all, it would be with one eye open. After a while, she drifted off to sleep and I stayed awake listening to the sounds of the woods at night. I was awake for a few hours, just waiting to see if anything was going to happen. At some point, I guess my exhaustion caught up with me and I drifted off. I awoke some time later to what sounded like someone going through our stuff outside the tent. I grabbed my gun and woke my girlfriend, shushing her to be quiet. From the faint glow of the fire, I could see someone's silhouette against the tent. There really was someone out there. I yelled out to them something along the lines of, We are armed! Get the fuck out of here! They dropped what they were doing and bolted. I came out of the tent, gun drawn and ready to shoot someone. Our stuff was strewn all about. They had rummaged through quite a bit of our stuff. I walked to the edge of the woods in the direction whoever was out there had fled. There was a creek nearby and I walked to the edge where there was a small trail running alongside it. Down the creek, I could see a light. It looked like a lantern the way it flickered. Then I saw three more emerge from the other side of the woods. I told my girlfriend to start packing up whatever she could and that we were leaving now. We packed up everything of value, left the tent and a few other items and headed back onto the trail in the middle of the night. I kept hearing people talking off in the woods and hearing branches snap for quite some ways. I kept looking behind us every few seconds to make sure nobody was coming up on us. It was completely nerve-wracking. If something happened, we were still a long ways from anywhere and quite literally on our own since we hadn't seen another hiker the entire time we'd been out there. I really felt we were in serious danger. We had been walking for quite some time when I heard something in the woods behind us. As we rounded a corner, I turned around and saw someone step out onto the trail and just stand there watching us. It was just as the sun was coming up and there was barely any light so I couldn't make out any features, it was just the silhouette. I stopped and looked at them for a sec and asked them who they were and what they wanted. They just stood there, silently watching us and then turned and walked back into the woods. We picked up the pace and kept going, looking back every so often. We didn't see them again but my gut told me that they were still there for quite a ways. We eventually reached the end of the trail and got to where we had parked my girlfriend's car, extremely exhausted. 
we made it out of the Virginia woods without becoming a meal for a clan of cannibalistic inbred hillbillies, which is what I pictured happening in my head the whole time. I have no idea who they were or what they wanted. Maybe it was just someone messing with us? Or maybe it really was a clan of deformed hillbillies who were hunting us. I'll never know because I will not be returning to find out. Around two years ago, I finally moved into a brand new house in a brand new building estate in Australia. I was one of the first to have a finished build in the area and was elated to finally gain independence. The first few weeks went by as normal and during that time, I'd often take walks alone with the dog in the afternoons and roam the surrounding estate area. All the roads around us had been partially completed and all the other properties were marked out but no other houses were built excluding the one that was directly opposite of mine. The house looked finished but there was no driveway laid yet and from what I could gather no one lived there. To the left of my house, roughly a few hundred meters away, was a field with a huge hill on it. I later found out that the whole area was council property. Not only was no one allowed to build up there, but the whole hill was basically a no-go zone. For whatever reason, the council just didn't want people on it, so the whole area was surrounded by a huge chain-link fence. The only other noticeable feature in the area was a small abandoned farmhouse with a shed a few kilometers down the road. I knew nothing about it and often went walking there with the dog as it gave me something mild to explore amongst the vast nothingness I was living around. The entire place was dilapidated and completely inhabitable, but it was still interesting nonetheless. About a month or two after moving in, I awoke one morning to the sound of a violin. It sounded extremely distant and quite haunting. I actually enjoyed it and assumed that the neighbors opposite me had finally moved in. Excited that I finally had some people to talk to, I peeked out the curtain and saw that the house opposite mine was still as vacant as it ever was. I got dressed, but by the time I managed to look outside, the violin had stopped. This happened roughly every second day for the next week. The violin would wake me up and then just disappear after about 45 seconds. I'd ignored it to the point where my curiosity simply got the better of me and the next morning when I heard the violin playing again I immediately jumped out of bed, threw on my dressing gown and shot out the front door. I scoured the early morning surrounding and there, up on the hill was a figure playing a violin. It was barely light but the person looked very tall from the distance I was at and as they were playing, they were doing what only could be described as a waltz type walk spinning slowly around in a circle as they played. I took my eyes off the person and walked over to pick up the morning paper and in the 10 seconds that took me, I heard the violin stop. When I looked up, I noticed the figure was no longer playing or dancing, but was now standing still and most likely looking in my direction. It was so dark I couldn't make out and we both just stood there for half a minute not moving before the creeps got the better of me and I went back inside. After that morning, things started happening. On my walks, I began to notice footprints on the surrounding properties that weren't made by me and that I'd never seen before, which I just assumed were from people walking up from the other housing areas down the road. I never awoke to the violin, but I swore I could hear someone walking down the street next to my bedroom window in the early mornings. However, I never saw anything. Other really general things as well like random tools such as spades and rakes laying around the area which I guessed were left there by construction crews, none of which I ever saw. I'd start getting calls at work that would immediately hang up on me and I also stopped walking up to the abandoned farmhouse, as the experience with the violin player had me a little shaken. One night, as I was heading to bed, I turned off the television in the living room and again could hear the faint sound of a violin playing. However, it sounded more muffled and rehearsed. I froze and a cold chill flowed through me instantaneously. Considering that it was about midnight and not the usual time I'd hear it playing, I went to the front window and peeked out to see that there was a light in the house opposite mine. 
It was clearly a candle, as I could see the dim light flicker in the empty window and the music sounded like it was coming from an old record player. But, in the ten minutes I watched, I never saw any movement from inside the house. I moved away from the window, sufficiently freaked out, and after another five minutes, I heard the music abruptly stop. I peeked out again to notice that the light was now out. I never saw anyone. I began to become unsettled in the house and would often invite friends over to hang out until late. But, of course, nothing would ever happen when someone else was with me. I never bothered to tell any of my friends, as without evidence I figured they'd just give me shit about it and I'd just become more agitated. But nothing compared to what happened next. In my living area, the desk sits right next to a small window which looks out to the fence surrounding my property. The steel fence is literally an arm's length from the house and about six feet tall, so I always figured that, unlike most of the other windows, I'd never need to cover this one with a sheet or blanket because no one could ever see in. I usually had headphones on when I played and I always had the lights off for no other reason other than that I preferred to play games in the dark. One night when I was gaming, I got up and walked into the dark kitchen and got a beer out of the fridge. It was dead silent, excluding the faint sound coming out of my headphones. As I closed the fridge and turned around to face the desk, I saw directly out the window two very, very faint lights. I didn't even catch on and immediately started walking back to the desk, fixated on the two small glowing balls and it wasn't until I had my nose almost pressed against the glass that I realized the two lights weren't lights at all. They were eyes. A set of eyes sitting just above the fence line staring wide open at me. They didn't blink, they didn't move. My entire body locked up. All I could do was simply stare back as my brain was still comprehending that there was an actual person looking at me in the scariest way I could ever possibly imagine. I don't know what happened. It, it, either my head kicked into gear or my muscles loosened, but my body automatically collapsed and I fell to the floor, scurrying to hide against the wall away from the window. I could hear my heart beating through the carpet like a drum as I tried to lay as flat as possible. And as my mind was still processing the sheer severity of the situation, a violin started playing. That fucking violin and the haunting tune it always emitted started up. Except this time, it was directly outside my window and much louder than I'd ever heard it before. The lights were still off and I wanted to get up to turn off the PC screen so I couldn't be seen, but my whole body just wasn't ready to cooperate. Not only was the sound of the instrument extraordinarily loud, but it sounded like it was being played with frustration. Notes being missed frequently and the strings screeching. The pace of it was getting faster and faster, and by this time my dog Jeb out in the backyard had picked up on the situation and, registering an unfamiliar sound, gave one solitary deep bark. The violin instantly stopped and the house was finally dead silent, excluding my headphones, which I could hear quietly working away. I was still frozen to the carpet, and it wasn't until Jeb gave me a second menacing bark that I heard the figure outside the window start to walk away in the direction of my yard. Once that first footstep hit the ground, I instantly thought of the welfare of my best friend, and finally, my head connected with my extremities and my entire body kicked into overdrive. I left from the ground and slid across the laminated floor to the back door where Jeb was standing. I ducked down to keep low and quietly unlocked and slid open the door. Usually doing so would notify Jeb that he was allowed inside, but when the door opened up, he didn't move an inch and was completely fixated on the pitch black backyard. Everything told me not to go outside, but there was no chance I was letting anything happen to my dog. So I moved out onto the alfresco, moved behind Jeb, put my hand under his collar and attempted to back him towards the house. Jeb is a pure Labrador and weighs like a sack of sand, so when he doesn't want to move, it takes sheer force to pull him in the direction you want him to go, and right now, Jeb wasn't going anywhere. I yanked at his scruff, and as I did, he emitted a bark like I'd never heard before. A deep, bellowing, fuck-off sound that elevated my nerves to an all-time high. We both just stood there, waiting for some form of reply. I couldn't remember how long we both just froze there, but eventually I heard footsteps from around the side of the house begin to walk away. 
but not a simple walk, almost like whoever was doing it was slowly dancing in a circle, the footsteps keeping to a beat as they drifted away from the house into the distance. Once I couldn't hear anything anymore, Jeb licked his lips, gave me a look, and wandered back inside. I followed, locked the door behind me, and spent the night reverting to my childlike self, hiding under my bed covers with my dog. I didn't sleep at all. That was the last time I ever saw or heard the violin player. The following morning when the sun finally came up, I called into work sick and called the police. They scoured the lot next to mine and found footprints in the dirt, however, there were so many that it was impossible to tell whose were whose. The only description I could give the officer was his height. He would have had to have been over six feet to stare over that fence at me, but they explained that he could have been standing on something or on his toes. They also told me that they've never received a report of anyone playing a violin in the area or anyone being in the fenced off hill area either. I essentially looked like an insane person. But the officers were very nice about the whole thing and offered to patrol the area for the next few nights. Nothing else has happened since then. Over the next year or two, people finally started moving in and I tell them all the story about the figure I saw. Some of them still use the story to keep their children in line, which I found funny. One guy even nicknamed the council lot Violin Hill and the name has stuck around our street since then. I even spent a period of time scouring the depths of the internet for that violin tune I kept hearing, but I could never find it. There were a few classical pieces that seemed reminiscent, but I've since thought that whatever tune was played must have been self-composed, which really creeps me out even more. I'm still in the house, I still tell people the story, and I haven't changed my routine one bit, which has really helped me to block out the fear of the experience. I game with the blinds closed now. I began babysitting at 13 to earn extra money to spend on horribly embarrassing things like Fallout Boy CDs. I would almost always work for my dad's clients, as he was a lawyer, and get referred by word of mouth. I was babysitting for this one family who had a little girl who was nine and a little boy who was seven. The parents seemed okay, if a tad crotchety, giving me a full schedule to follow and jokingly threatening to beat any boy who might mysteriously show up after they left. It felt cruel for them to accuse me of even knowing a boy given I basically looked like an overgrown baby with frizzy hair at that age. Almost immediately after the parents leave, the little girl sings in a creepy, high-pitched voice. We're all alone now. Alright, cue the Shining soundtrack. I know, the little boy chimed in. Let's play rape. Looking back now, I know the kid probably just heard the term on TV, knew the word was shocking, and said it just for a reaction. I totally bought into it at the time, sputtering wide-eyed and changing the subject quickly. These kids were hell for the next hour. I wouldn't let them watch South Park on TV because their parents did not seem like the type to allow their precious 7 and 9 year old to watch a show like that. As soon as I said no, the little girl said casually, Oh, that's fine, we'll just go play PlayStation in the family room. Feel free to watch it out here. Uh, nope, I knew exactly where that was headed. I said they could watch any other TV show in the living room while I made them dinner. The parents had left instructions to make them sandwiches. I could handle that. Before I had even got out the bread, I hear a massive crash. It seems like the little girl has broken a glass. Tutting and pissed, but ultimately with no way to punish her, I cleaned it up while these two incredibly weird kids watched with wide eyes. Dumping the broken glass in the trash, I went back to making the sandwiches. Now, I'm a vegetarian, so while the kids had chicken, I'd made a simple salad one for myself. Just as I was finishing, the little boy screamed out in what sounded like the pantomime of pain. Nonetheless, I ran over to the couch in the living room to check on him. He started screaming, my ankle, while dramatically flopping back onto the couch. While I tried to figure out how he had hurt his ankle, the little girl slipped out of the room. Peripherally, I was aware of this, but didn't really pay it any mind as I was focused on the little boy pretending to be in pain. 
He kept saying that he went to stand, but it hurt too much and he doesn't know and things like that over and over again until his eyes suddenly flicked to just behind me, where I could see the little girl standing with a perturbing smile on her face. All of a sudden, he was miraculously healed. Yeah, praise the Lord. At this point, I was just thinking these kids were really weird, craved attention a little too much, and probably needed more parental involvement. Whatever, I was 13 and that $60 was only 4 hours away. I set out the sandwiches for the two to eat at the dining table, went to get us soda, and returned. After pouring soda for the both of them, I realized they hadn't even taken a bite of their sandwiches yet. So, I asked them what they were waiting for. They smiled. For you to take a bite of yours. I am so glad I had a gut feeling to open the top part of the bread of my sandwich. Because when I did, I saw a glass. Broken glass. Broken glass that I put in the trash before. I stared in horror at the two little kids staring at me with menacing twin grins. I lost it, shouting, Are you serious? At the very least, you could have really injured my mouth. What is wrong with you two? Instead of crying or apologizing or pretending to be ashamed or confused, these two little fuckers began laughing. Not like kids, it was too low. It wasn't that silly, free laugh, kids laugh. It was low and threatening. I'll never forget that noise. My immediate reaction was, these kids are too young to be laughing like that. I called my older sister, who was 17 at the time, cried about what had happened and she came and took over for me. We left the house with chills after the parents arrived. I never babysat for those two again. What I can't get past is the level of premeditation that went into sprinkling that broken glass into my sandwich, and the totally remorseless way they responded to me getting upset. They were unlike any two kids I've ever met before. And what would a classic scary stories video be without the good old smiling man story? About five years ago, I lived downtown in a major city in the US. I've always been a night person, so I would often find myself bored after my roommate, who was decidingly not a night person, went to sleep. To pass the time, I used to go for long walks and spend the time thinking. I spent four years like that, walking alone at night, and never once had a reason to feel afraid. But all of that changed in just a few minutes of one evening. It was a Wednesday, somewhere between 1 and 2 in the morning, and I was walking near a police patrolled park quite a ways from my apartment. It was a quiet night, even for a weeknight, with very little traffic and almost no one on foot. The park, as it was most nights, was completely empty. I turned down a short side street in order to loop back to my apartment when I first noticed him. At the far end of the street, on my side, was the silhouette of a man dancing. It was a strange dance, similar to a waltz, but he finished each box with an odd forward stride. I guess you could say he was dance walking, headed straight for me. Deciding he was probably drunk, I stepped as close as I could to the road to give him the majority of the sidewalk to pass me by. The closer he got, the more I realized how gracefully he was moving. He was very tall and lanky and wearing an old suit. He danced closer, still, until I could make out his face. His eyes were open wide and wild and head tilted back slightly, looking off at the sky. His mouth was formed in a painfully wide cartoon of a smile. Between the eyes and smile, I decided to cross the street before he danced any closer. I took my eyes off of him to cross the empty street. As I reached the other side, I glanced back and then stopped dead in my tracks. He had stopped dancing and was standing with one foot in the street, perfectly parallel to me. He was facing me, but still looking skyward, smile still wide on his lips. I was completely and utterly unnerved by this. I started walking again, but kept my eyes on the man. He didn't move. Once I had put about half a block between us, I turned away from him for a moment to watch the sidewalk in front of me. The street and sidewalk ahead of me were completely empty. Still unnerved, I looked back to where he had been standing to find him gone. For the briefest of moments, I felt relieved. 
until I noticed him. He had crossed the street and was now slightly crouched down. I had looked away from him for no more than 10 seconds, so it was clear that he had moved fast. I was so shocked that I stood there for some time, staring at him. And then he started moving toward me again. He took giant, exaggerated, tiptoed steps as if he were a cartoon character sneaking up on someone. Except he was moving very, very quickly. I'd like to say at this point I ran away or pulled out my pepper spray or my cell phone or anything at all, but I didn't. I just stood there, completely frozen as the smiling man crept toward me. And then he stopped again, about a car length away from me, still smiling his smile, still looking to the sky. When I finally found my voice, I blurted out the first thing that came to mind. What I meant to ask was, What do you want? In an angry, commanding tone, what came out was a whimper. What do you... Regardless of whether or not humans can smell fear, they can certainly hear it. I heard it in my own voice, and that only made me more afraid. But he didn't react to it at all. He just stood there, smiling. And then, after what felt like forever, he turned around very slowly and started dance walking away. Just like that. Not wanting to turn my back to him again, I just watched him go until he was far enough away to be almost out of sight. And then I realized something. He wasn't moving away anymore, nor was he dancing. I watched in horror as the distant shape of him grew larger and larger. He was coming back my way. And this time, he was running. I ran too. I ran until I was off of the side road and back onto a better lit road with sparse traffic. Looking behind me then, he was nowhere to be found. The rest of the way home, I kept glancing over my shoulder, always expecting to see his stupid smile, but he was never there. I lived in that city for six months after that night, and I never went out for another walk. There was something about his face that always haunted me. He didn't look drunk. He didn't look high. He looked completely and utterly insane. And that's a very very scary thing to see.